Hey guys, welcome back. TJ here with Dead History, and welcome to part two of our next Declaration of Independence Signer Series video, taking a look, of course, at William Hooper from North Carolina. Part two today, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed part one yesterday, looking at the early life and his time in Boston and then moving down to North Carolina. Hope you enjoyed all of that. And now today in part two, we're going to take a look at leading all the way up to the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And then what did William Hooper do after that? After he signed the Declaration, what was his life, his legacy, and then of course his death and his gravesite here in part two. So we're going to take a look at all that today. And I have a very special guest with me. Why, hello, Mr. Henry. Hello. How you doing? Good. What's going on? Anything? No. How's school? Good. School's good? Yeah. Yeah? What would he got? Only about three weeks or so left before Christmas? Yeah. You excited? Yeah. Yeah? You're, you're, you are a man of few words, I got to tell you. <laughs> but sometimes I can't get you to stop uh, talking, so it's crazy. <laughs> what else is up? Anything? No. Yeah? Hey, guess what? You want to hear something cool? Yeah. So we're doing William Hooper this week, and he's our first signer from? North Carolina. North Carolina. Our second signer from North Carolina next week is actually going to be a guy by the name of Joseph Hughes. And you want to hear something really cool? Yeah. Guess where Joseph Hughes was born? I don't know. Princeton, Indiana? New Jersey. Ooh. Yeah. Princeton, New Jersey, and lived there for a long time. And he's buried only in Philadelphia. He's not even buried down in North Carolina. Pretty cool, right? You've actually been to his grave in Philly with me. You don't remember that? Mm -hmm. Do you remember that one cemetery where, like, when you look down, you can kind of see, like, water? And we were kind of, like, searching around it for a few minutes. And yeah. you even went back to the car the one day because you were like, I'm done looking. Yeah. Do you remember that at all? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That older cemetery, he's yeah. in there. Pretty cool, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, Henry. Well, thanks for stopping in and saying hi for this part two. You're welcome. And we'll see you uh, probably not next week, but we'll oh. see you the week after that, right? Yes. Sounds good. Thanks, Henry. You're welcome. In 1764, William Hooper moved temporarily to Wilmington, North Carolina, where he began to practice law and became the circuit court lawyer for Cape Fear. Hooper began to build a highly respected reputation in North Carolina among the wealthy farmers as well as fellow lawyers. Hooper increased his influence by representing the colonial government in several court cases. In 1767, William Hooper married Anne Clark, the daughter of a wealthy early settler to the region and sheriff of New Hanover County. They had three children, William, Elizabeth, and Thomas. William Hooper moved quickly up the ranks, first in 1769 when he was appointed as deputy attorney of the Salisbury District, and then in 1770 when he was appointed deputy attorney general of North Carolina. Initially, William Hooper supported the British colonial government of North Carolina. As Deputy Attorney General in 1768, Hooper worked with Colonial Governor William Ty Tryon. Yeah, William Tryon, I believe is his name. That's how you pronounce it. He worked with him to suppress a rebellious group known as the Regulators who participated in in the War of the Regulation. The Regulators had been operating in North Carolina for some time, and in 1770, it was reported that the group dragged Hooper through the streets in Hillsboro during a riot. Hooper advised the Governor Tryon you use as much force as was necessary to stamp out the rebels and even accompanied the troops at the Battle of Albanance in 1771. He served in the province of North Carolina, House of Burgesses, in 1775. 
after marrying into a prominent North Carolina family, Hooper used his considerable personal and professional qualities to win election to the state legislature. He seemed solidly installed as a rising member of the ruling class. In late 1770, a backcountry rebellion broke out against the dominance of the eastern coastal aristocracy. This uprising, called the War of the Regulation, pitted unpropertied citizens from the western part of the colony against the landed gentry from the east. William Hooper, a loyalist then, fought against these regulators as a member of Governor Tryon's expedition in the spring of 1771. How drastically the picture was to change. As British oppression of the colonies increased, William Hooper became a leading defender of American rights. Both his and his wife's families remain loyalist, but Hooper eloquently advocated resistance. Surprisingly, perhaps many of the regulators, once bitter foes of the established authority, now align themselves with King George. Rebels and loyalists had switched sides. William Hooper suffered greatly from the war, frequently being forced to endure prolonged separations from his wife and children. On several occasions, he was forced to flee to avoid capture. His home and possessions in Wilmington were destroyed, and it was not until 1782 that he was able to rejoin his family permanently in their new residence at Hillsboro. And of course, just reading from a bunch of different sources, as I said, that I will be doing. After becoming a leading attorney in Wilmington, Along North Carolina's coast, Hooper married a woman named Ann Clark, the daughter of a local loyalist, whom he promptly embarrassed. It's hard to shake one's upbringing. William Hooper may have been a radical, a rebel and a patriot, but he would forever be an aristocrat. As a young attorney general, he became enmeshed in a political uprising begun in the 1760s, known as the Regulator Movement, or the War of Regulation. Simply put, poor North Carolinan settlers had become fed up with what they perceived as corruption, excessive fees, and taxation by the ruling elite and their enforcers, usually sheriffs. William Hooper, in his role as attorney, was seen by the mob as part of the larger problem, and he was attacked by vigilante regulators. Some sources say he was beaten or harassed in a courtroom, while others say he was dragged through the streets. The experience left an indelible impression. The unwashed masses were not to be trusted. Perhaps because of this experience, William Hooper was leery of mob rule and of democracy in general for the rest of his life. Beginning about 1773, William Hooper wrote letters supporting the American cause and served on North Carolina's first provincial congress, where he was highly regarded as a gifted spokesman for American rights. In April of 1774, a letter to his friend James Iredell, Hooper wrote, The colonies are striding fast to independence and will, ere long, build an empire among the ruins of Great Britain, will adopt its constitution, purged of its impurities and from an experience of its defects, will guard against those evils which have wasted its vigor and brought it to an untimely end. This letter, thought to be the first prediction of American independence, 
is the reason William Hooper is dubbed the prophet of independence. He's also known as the misunderstood patriot. We will see why shortly. Hooper was elected to the Continental Congress in 1774 and served until 1777. Although he supported the Lee Resolution, William Hooper was away on business during the critical vote. He returned to Philadelphia in time to sign the famous document in August. He was the youngest North Carolina signer, only 34 years old. Another source here. In 1771, William Hooper was elected to the assembly from the borough of Campbelltown and by election from New Hanover County. He remained a member until the royal government was overthrown. He was on the Committee of Correspondence And when the Boston Port Bill was passed, he led the movement to send relief. He also presided over the meeting, which appointed a committee to call the first provincial congress and was elected to all five of the congresses. He did not attend the last one. By the first of these congresses, he was elected to the Continental Congress, where he was on many committees and took part in the debates. As an orator, John Adams compared him with Richard Henry Lee and Patrick Henry. William Hooper was the leader of those against the new laws by the British Party for Regulation of the Courts of Justice. He published a series of essays under the name of Hamden, which made the people aware of the importance of the issues of the times. His own fortune suffered because of the resulting suspension of all courts for over a year. In 1774, 75, and 76, he was a delegate to the Continental Congress. He was absent from the vote for independence on July 4th of 1776, but returned in time to sign the Declaration of Independence in August. William Hooper resigned his seat in the Continental Congress on April 29th of 1777. At the impending capture of Wilmington in 1782, Hooper was driven from his residence nearby. A house belonging to him was fired upon by a British vessel in the Cape Fear River. In 1782, Hooper went to Hillsborough. Two years later, He was once again in the House of Commons. He was an advocate of the federal constitution, and although he was defeated in his attempt to be a delegate to the Hillsborough Convention, he lived to see the constitution ratified. In 1786, William Hooper was one of the federal judges who resolved the territorial rights of New York and Massachusetts. He continued to hold a distinguished place at the bar and the councils of North Carolina until his death. Now, what I think I'm going to do is read from that old source that I've uh, always been reading from, the one that I believe was written back in the 1800s sometime. Uh, William Hooper became connected by marriage with Miss Ann Clark of Wilmington in that province. William Hooper now devoted himself with great zeal to his professional duties. He early enjoyed the confidence of his fellow citizens and was highly respected by his brethren at the bar among whom he occupied an an enviable rank. In the year 1773, Hooper was appointed to represent the town of Wilmington in which he resided in the General Assembly. In the following year, he was elected to his seat in the same body, soon after taking which he was called upon to assist in opposing a most tyrannical act of the British government in respect to the laws regulating the courts of justice in the province. The former laws in relation to these courts being about to expire, 
others became necessary. Accordingly, a bill was brought forward, the provisions of which were designed to regulate the courts as formally. But the advocates of the British government took occasion to introduce a clause into the bill which was intended to exempt from attachment all species of property in North Carolina which belonged to non-residents. This bill, having passed the Senate and been approved of by the governor, was sent to the House of Representatives where it met with a most spirited opposition. In this opposition, William Hooper took the lead. In strong and animated language, he set forth the injustice of this part of the bill and remonstrated against its passage by the House. In consequence of the measures which were pursued by the respective houses composing the General Assembly, the province was left for more than a year without a single court of law. Personally, to William Hooper, the issue of this business was highly injurious, since he was thus deprived of the practice of his profession upon which he depended for his support. Conscious, however, of having discharged his duty, he bowed in submission to the pecuniary sacrifices to which he was thus called, preferring honorable poverty to the greatest pecuniary accusations, I'm sorry, acquisitions, if the latter must he made at the expense of principle. On August 25th, 1774, William Hooper was elected a delegate to the General Congress to be held at Philadelphia. Soon after taking his seat in this body, he was placed upon several important committees and when occasion required, took a share in the animated discussions which were had on the various important subjects which came before them. On one occasion, and the first on which he addressed the House, it is said that he so entirely riveted the attention of the members by his bold and animated language that many expressed their wonder that such eloquence should flow forth from a member from North Carolina. In the following year, William Hooper was again appointed a delegate to serve in the second General Congress, during whose session he was selected as the chairman of a committee appointed to report and address to the inhabitants of Jamaica. The drought was the production of his pen. It was characterized for great boldness and was eminently adapted to produce a strong impression upon the people for whom it was designed. In conclusion of the address, William Hooper used the following bold and animated language that our petitions have been treated with disdain it is now become the smallest part of our complaint. Ministerial insolence is lost in ministerial barbarity. It has been a, an exertion peculiarly ingenious procured those very measures which it laid us under the hard necessity of pursuing to be stigmatized in Parliament as rebellious. It has employed additional fleets and armies for the infamous purpose of compelling us to abandon them. It has plunged us all in all the horrors and calamities of a civil war. It has cost the treasure and blood of Britons, formerly shed and expended for far other ends, to be split and wasted in the design of spreading slavery over British America. It will not, however, accomplish its aim in the worst of contingencies. A choice will still be left, which it never can prevent us from making. In January of 1776, William Hooper was appointed with Dr. Franklin and Mr. Livingston a committee to report to Congress a proper method of honoring the memory of General Montgomery, who had then recently fallen beneath the walls of Quebec. This committee, in their report, 
recommended the erection of a monument, which, while it expressed the respect and affection of the colonies, might record, for the benefit of future ages, the patriotic zeal and fidelity, enterprise, and perseverance of the hero, whose memory the monument was designed to celebrate. In compliance with the recommendation of this committee, a monument was afterwards erected by Congress in the city of New York. In the spring of 1776, the private business of William Hooper so greatly required his attention in North Carolina that he did not attend upon the sitting of Congress. He returned, however, in season to share in the honor of passing and publishing to the world the immortal Declaration of Independence. On December 20th of 1776, William Hooper was elected a delegate to Congress for the third time. The embarrassed situation of his private affairs, however, rendered his longer absence from Carolina inconsistent with his interests. Accordingly, in February of 1777, he relinquished his seat in Congress and not long after tendered to the General Assembly his resignation of the important trust. But although Hooper found it necessary to retire from this particular sphere of action, he was nevertheless usefully employed in Carolina. He was an ardent friend to his country, zealously attached to her rights and ready to make every required personal sacrifice for her good. Nor like many other patriots of the day, did he allow himself to indulge in despondency. While to others the prospect appeared dubious, he would always point to some brighter spots on the canvas, and upon these he delighted to dwell. In 1786, William Hooper was appointed by Congress one of the judges of a federal court, which was formed for the purpose of settling a controversy which existed between the states of New York and Massachusetts. In regard to certain lands, the jurisdiction of which each pretended to claim. The point at issue was of great importance, not only as it related to a considerable extent of territory, but in respect of the people of these two states, among whom great excitement prevailed on the subject. Fortunately, the respective parties themselves appointed commissioners to settle the dispute, which was at length amicably done, and the above federal court was saved a most difficult and delicate duty. In the following year, the constitutional infirmities of William Hooper increasing, his health became considerably impaired. He now gradually relaxed from public and professional exertions, and in a short time sought repose in retirement which he greatly coveted. In the month of October of 1790, at the early age of 48 years, he was called to exchange worlds. He left a widow, two sons and a daughter, the last of whom only, it is believed, still lives. Again, this was written in the 1800s, clearly. In his person, William Hooper was of middle stature, well-formed, but of delicate and slender appearance. He carried a pleasing and intelligent countenance. In his manners, he was polite and engaging, although towards those with whom he was not particularly acquainted, he was somewhat reserved. He was distinguished for his powers of conversation in point of literary literary merit he had few but few rivals in the neighborhood in which he dwelt as a lawyer he was distinguished for his professional knowledge and zeal in respect to business with which he was entrusted towards his brethren he ever maintained a high and honorable course of conduct and particularly towards the younger members of the bar As a politician, he was characterized for judgment, ardor, 
and constancy in times of the greatest political difficulty and danger he was calm but resolute he never desponded but trusting to the justice of his country's cause he had an unshaking confidence that heaven would protect and deliver her with only a few years to live the war had so drained his strength and depleted his finances that he died prematurely in 1790 at the age of 48. John Adams admired Hooper and considered him one of the finest speakers in Congress. The statue over Hooper's burial place near Greensboro, North Carolina, shows him driving a point home with oratorical vigor. But the real proof of Hooper's medal was the sacrifices he made in the cause of American freedom. His old mentor, James Otis, would have been proud of him. Upon leaving Congress, William Hooper returned home, determined to shore up his failing fortune. In those days, serving Congress brought with it serious financial consequences. Paying room and board in Philadelphia all while shelling out cash for a family you never saw back home was enough to impoverish most men. Hooper appears to have suffered greatly during the war, though the specifics of his loss are murky. In January of 1781, the British arrived at the Cape Fear River, which runs through the heart of Wilmington, North Carolina. William Hooper likely possessed two homes in the area, one in town and another closer to the beach. Both were destroyed. Hooper and his family separated and he fled to the North Carolina backcountry, relying on friends for shelter and food. While on the run, he contracted malaria, which plagued him with fever, chills, and flu-like symptoms until the end of his days. William Hooper and his family were reunited after the British left the area, but in 1782, they relocated to a home in Hillsboro, North Carolina, just northwest of Durham. William Hooper lived only another eight years. He served in the new state legislature, but was never a popular leader. Lacking the common touch, he was an aloof politician who continued to fear democracy and the possibility that it might descend into mob rule. Loyalists hated him for his anti-British beliefs. Patriots hated him for blocking reprisals, reprisals against loyalists. William Hooper also found himself arguing against his colleagues about the new U.S. Constitution and his belief in a strong federal government, a sentiment many of his fellow North Carolinans strongly opposed. Though he had signed the greatest document in the land, he was a distrusted and misunderstood patriot for the rest of his days. He lived just long enough to see the Constitution ratified. Sapped by illness, William Hooper died in Hillsboro at the age of 48. He was buried on his property, but his remains and those of signer John Penn were moved more than 100 years later to the Gulford Courthouse Military Park in Greensboro, North Carolina. Theirs is a fine monument in a lovely park-like setting though neither had anything to do with the battle fought there against the British in 1781. William Hooper was a handsome man, possessed of grace and a charming manner. He had a brilliant mind as well. He was essentially an aristocrat, cultivated, fearless, and aloof, except to those intimates whom he loved and who loved him. His home on Mason Burrow Sound near Wilmington, North Carolina, was called Finian. After the revolution, his family was reunited, but much of his property had been destroyed. 
He was also very ill with malaria. He died on October 14th of 1790 at Hillsboro, North Carolina, and was buried in Hillsboro Town Cemetery. On April 24th of 1894, William Hooper's remains were reinterred under the Signers Monument, then under construction in the Gulford Courthouse National Military Park near Greensboro, North Carolina. A bronze statue of Hooper was mounted upon the monument, which was dedicated on July 3rd of 1897. And a little bit about his genealogy. Of course, he was born on June 17th of 1742 in Boston, Massachusetts. He was the eldest child of the Reverend William Hooper. In 1767, William Hooper married Ann Clark. Their children were Richard, William, Thomas, and Elizabeth. Um, and then it says here... Anne Clark was the daughter of Thomas Clark and Barbara Murray, early settlers of Wilmington, North Carolina, who had come from Boston, Massachusetts. And Anne Clark's brother was General Thomas Clark of the U.S. Army. William Hooper's support of the colonial governments began to erode, causing problems for him because of his past support of Governor Tryon. William Hooper had been labeled a loyalist, and therefore he was not immediately accepted by patriots. William Hooper eventually was elected to the North Carolina General Assembly in 1773, where he became an opponent to colonial attempts to pass laws that would regulate the provincial courts. This in turn helped to sour his reputation among loyalists. William Hooper recognized that independence was likely to occur and mentioned this in a letter to his friend James Iredell saying the colonies were striding fast to independence and ere long will build an empire upon the ruins of Great Britain. During his time in the assembly, Hooper slowly became a supporter of the American Revolution and independence. After the governor disbanded the assembly, William Hooper helped to organize a new colonial assembly. And then, of course, we know this. Continental Congress, he was elected. Of course, we know all of that. In 1777, because of continued financial concerns, Hooper resigned from Congress and returned to North Carolina to resume his law career. Throughout the Revolution, the British attempted to capture Hooper and with his country home in Finian, Vulnerable to British attacks, Hooper moved his way, moved his family away to Wilmington. 1781, the British captured Wilmington to where Cornwallis and his forces fell back after the Battle of the Gulliford Courthouse, and Hooper found himself separated from his family. In addition, the British burned his estates in both Finian and Wilmington, so William Hooper was forced to rely on friends for food and shelter during this time, as well as nursing him back to health when he contracted malaria. Finally, after nearly a year of separation, William Hooper was reunited with his family and they settled in Hillsboro, where Hooper continued to work for the North Carolina Assembly till 1783. After the revolution, William Hooper returned to his career in law but he lost favor with the public because of his political stance. William Hooper fell in line with the Federalist Party because of his influential connections, his mistrust of the lower class, and his widely criticized soft dealings with loyalists, toward whom he was generally forgiving. This kind and fair treatment made some even label him a loyalist. William Hooper was again called to public service We know this in 1786, federal judge for the border dispute between New York and Massachusetts. That court, that case was actually settled out of court. Um, October 14, 1790, he did die. The age of 48, he was laid to rest in the Presbyterian churchyard in Hillsborough, North Carolina. 
and then his remains were later reinterred at Gulliford Courthouse National Military Park. His home at Hillsborough, the Nash Hooper House, was declared a National Historic Landmark in 1971. It is located in the Hillsborough Historic District. So there's still a few accounts that I do want to read from. One of them is kind of lengthy, and it really goes into a lot of the real deep dive into, like, the British in that North Carolina area. Um, so I might read some of that. I'm not sure yet. Um, we kind of have gone over the basics of it. But uh, I do want to read definitely from this. So here we go. On August 16th of 1767... William Hooper married at King's Chapel in Boston, Massachusetts, Anne Clark of New Hanover, North Carolina, the daughter of Barbara Murray and Thomas Clark Sr., late High Sheriff of New Hanover County. Anne was the sister of Thomas Clark Jr., who became a colonel and brigadier general in the Continental Army. It was the fortunate affluence of the Clark family that enabled the William Hoopers to survive the difficult years of the American Revolution. It was in 1773 when William Hooper purchased land for his home on Masonboro Sound, eight miles below Wilmington. In 1774, he built his beach home and named it Finian. It is said that the Hoopers offered lavish hospitality to guests from far and wide, and Masonboro Sound provided pleasant surrounding for their three young children, William, Elizabeth, and Thomas. The Hoopers supposedly had three additional children that died while young. Aninus, Hooper, and daughter Hooper. So there was a son and a daughter Hooper. Son Hooper and daughter Hooper. So apparently they died very young. His formal entry into political life came on January 25th of 1773 when he sat for the first time in the Provincial Congress Assembly as a representative for the Scott settlement of Campbelltown, later Fayetteville. So I have made the decision to read you guys uh, from a couple of these sources that I feel are really, really, really good. Um, it, again, it's going to be a little lengthy, probably another like 20 minutes or so of this video, but it goes into like specific dates of some of the things that we've already discussed. I understand I'm going to be repeating some information, but this is much more detailed information than what I've already even given you in this episode. So... I feel it's important to do so. So, just wanted to preface it by saying that. So this is uh, in regards to when William Hooper started his political career and basically jumped into politics. We just had mentioned that. The assembly meeting at New Bern lasted only 42 days. But Hooper became acquainted with such recognized provincial leaders as Samuel Johnston, Alan Jones, and John Harvey. In the same year, William Hooper made the first purchase of land for his future home on Mason Borough Sound, eight miles below Wilmington. 108 acres of Caleb Granger's old Mason Borough Plantation. In 1774, Hooper bought 30 adjoining acres on which, which he built his house, Finian. The Hoopers offered lavish hospitality at Finian to guests from far and wide, and the sound provided pleasant surroundings for their three young, young children. In December of 1773, he was returned to the Provincial Assembly as representative for New Hanover County together with John Ash, leader of the Whig Party. On December 8th of 1773, the Assembly took the important step of appointing a standing committee of correspondence and inquiry 
and selected nine of the most significant leaders in the province to serve on it. Hooper's was the fourth name listed, and it was on this committee of communication that he made sig signal contributions throughout the revolutionary years. His prophetic observation, of course, was a letter on April 26th of 1774 to his friend James Iredell. It's often quoted as a landmark of colonial foresight at this early period. We already went through that. We know exactly what happened and what he wrote to Iredell there. In June of 1774, the port of Boston was closed and William he Hooper took the lead in mustering aid and support for his native city. At a notable general meeting of Lower Cape Fear citizens in Wilmington on July 21st of 1774, Hooper was elected chairman and presided over the selection of a committee to issue the historic call for the first provincial congress. A significant resolve approved by the New Bern meeting stated, we consider the cause of the town of Boston as the common cause of British America and as suffering in defense of the rights of the colonies in general. Two shiploads of provisions and 2,000 pounds in currency were sent for the relief of the Massachusetts port town. Already, the 32-year-old Hooper's diverse talents pers for persuasive oratory and fluent writing, plus his ardent personal commitment to the colonial cause and his trained knowledge of civil and admiralty law had combined to make him a most useful and effective leader in any assembly in which he sat. When the first provincial congress, the first such convention ever to meet without royal assent, duly convened in New Bern on August 25th through the 28th of 1774. William Hooper was named the first of three delegates to represent North Carolina at the First Continental Congress, which met on September 20th, 1774, at Carpenter's Hall in Philadelphia. The other two envoys were Richard Caswell and Joseph Hughes. Although Hooper was one of the youngest of the 50 delegates in Philadelphia, he was immediately named to a committee to state the rights of the colonies and to another to report on legal statutes affecting trade and commerce in the colonies. Richard Henry Lee, Patrick Henry, and William Hooper are the orators of the Congress, wrote John Adams. Back in Wilmington, William Hooper was named to the Wilmington Committee of Safety, formed on November 23rd of 1774. He could not, however, be present until December 30th of that year. There now began the steady, physically exhausting cross-country travel by horseback between Philadelphia and North Carolina that Hooper continued until the spring of 1777. Nearly all of his work in both places followed the same routine, long days of committee sessions and staggering amounts of correspondence, reports and addresses to be written at night. At Philadelphia, there was the added burden of purchasing supplies at warehouses and wharves and dispatching them to committees of safety and militia at home. Moreover, yellow fever in Philadelphia and malaria in Wilmington were constant hazards. Before the close of 1776, William Hooper had attended three continental congresses, four provincial congresses. He did not attend the fifth in Halifax in November of 1776 because of the pressure of work in Philadelphia and four provincial assemblies besides meetings of the Wilmington Committee of Safety. Almost invariably, he was made chairman or member of any committee with important resolutions or addresses to compose. And some of the most significant statements of the revolution, crystallizing public opinion, came either wholly or partially from his pen. At the lengthy Third Provincial Congress from August 20th to September 10th of 1775, which met for safety's sake, 
far inland at Hillsboro, William Hooper was made chairman of a committee to prepare a test oath for the 184 delegates. Since the Battle of Lexington on April 19th, tension and alarm had been rampant. Hooper was appointed to a committee to prepare an ex explanatory address to the people of North Carolina and named chairman of another to prepare an address to the inhabitants of the British Empire. William Hooper alone composed the most important British... Br Hold on. He composed the most important British Empire address, declaring the views of the Congress on the existing state of affairs. Besides other assignments, he was also one of a committee of 45 delegates to devise a temporary government for the province. About February 1st of 1776, William Hooper quietly absented himself from the Continental Congress in Philadelphia to go to his widow mother's aid in Cambridge, Massachusetts. According to Joseph Hughes, Mrs. Hooper had only lately got out of Boston and her patriot son was greatly alarmed for her safety. Still absent from Philadelphia a month later, William Hooper may have seized this opportunity to escort his mother to Milton, North Carolina, where she is said to have spent her later years. Her death date is unknown. The 4th Provincial Congress convened at Halifax on April 4th of 1776, and William Hooper and John Penn, who had replaced Caswell, appeared on April 15th, three days after the passage of the Halifax Resolves. William Hooper was immediately made chairman of a committee to supply the province with ammunition and warlike stores, and he and Penn were added to a committee to produce a civil constitution and to another on secrecy, war, and intelligence. Both men were placed on committees to consider business necessary to be brought before the Congress and to form a temporary government, as well as on a committee of inquiry. William Hooper, Hughes, and Penn were all reappointed delegates to the Third Continental Congress, which convened on May 10th of 1776. In Philadelphia, William Hooper served on Hughes's Marine Committee with Benjamin Franklin on the highly important Committee of Secret Intelligence, which had broad powers to hire secret agents abroad, make agreements, and even to conceal information from the Congress itself. And on Thomas Jefferson's committee to compose a Declaration of Independence. Although Hooper was absent when, absent when independence, independence was actually voted and declared on July 4th of 1776, he, like most of the other delegates, affixed it his name to the amended declaration on August 2nd. For the rest of the year, William Hooper was concerned with committees for the regulation of the post office, the treasury, secret correspondence, admiralty courts, laws of capture, and the like. On December 22nd, he was appointed chairman of a committee with Hughes and Thomas Burke to devise a great seal for the new state of North Carolina. Early in 1777, Hooper and numerous other delegates were stricken with yellow fever. On February 4th, he secured permission to return to Wilmington to attend the General Assembly on April 8th, and on April 29th, he formally resigned his seat in the U.S. Congress. The situation of my own private affairs did not leave me a moment in suspense whether I should decline the honor intended me, he wrote to Robert Morris. He was succeeded by Cornelius Harnett and never again appeared on the national scene. William Hooper resumed his residence at Finian and his law practice in the newly opened courts, again riding the circuits with his friend Iridell as he had done before the revolution. He attended the General Assembly of 1777, 78, 79, 80, and 81 as member for the borough of Wilmington 
serving on numerous committees. When it appeared that Finian would not be safe from British men of war in Masonboro Sound, a house owned by Hooper three miles below Wilmington was burned and Finian was shelled. Hooper moved his family into the town. He himself at times seriously ill with malaria and his right arm badly swollen became a fugitive from the British, going from friends' houses to friends' houses in the Windsor Edenton area. On January 29th of 1781, Major James H. Craig's men took Wilmington, although the town was not evacuated until November. Then, an ailing Mrs. Hooper and two of her children were forced to flee by wagon to Hillsboro, where her brother, General Clark, found shelter for them. Finally, on April 10th of 1782, the reunited Hoopers purchased General Francis Nash's former home on West Tryon Street, still standing, and in 1972 named a National Historic Landmark. With his permanent removal to the backcountry, William Hooper was now entirely out of the mainstream of current events, both state and national. His election to the 1782 General Assembly as member for Wilmington was declared invalid. And in 1783, he suffered the first political loss of his career at the hands of Hillsborough, Hillsborough Tavern Keeper Thomas Farmer, who defeated him for a seat in the General Assembly. One absorbing new interest developed, however. Some years before, in 1778, William Hooper had been named on first on a committee of nine prominent men to begin an academy science hall in the vicinity of Hillsboro. The school had made a brave start on Colonel Thomas Hart's Hartford Plantation, but it had been swept aside by revolutionary activity. Now Hooper pushed a new academy bill through the 1784 assembly to which he was elected and almost single-handedly began a second venture, a new Hillsboro Academy, which prospered for a few years. Unfortunately, the November 1786 assembly at Fayetteville, the last that he attended, tabled a bill to raise funds for the school and thereby ensured its demise. William Hooper's law practice was still a considerable one owing to steady litigation concerning loyalist estates, confiscated lands, treason, and all the legal backwash of the revolution. Like Iredell and other conservative men, William Hooper lamented unreasonable severity and vengeful vengefulness against loyalists, loyalists and absentees and earned moderation in their treatment. In consequence, he found himself at painful odds with some of his old friends and acquaintances. On September 22, 1786, he was appointed to a federal court to settle a Massachusetts-New York territorial dispute, but the matter was resolved locally and the court never met. A bitter blow fell when William Hooper was not elected a delegate to the 1788 Constitutional Convention which met in Hillsborough's old St. Matthew's Church, then renovated as the new academy, literally within sight and sound of his own house. He never recovered from this second important rejection. The Iredell correspondence indicates that from 1787 onward, there had been a perceptible decline in Hooper's health and that like his fellow townsman, Thomas Burke, he had chosen to drown his increasing disillusionment in rum. He died at the age of 48 the evening before his daughter's Elizabeth's marriage to Colonel Henry Hearn Waters of the Cape Fear. William Hooper was buried in a corner of his garden and the brick wall plot was later incorporated into the adjoining Old Town Cemetery. On April 25th of 1894, the grave was opened at dawn 
before various family represent representatives and a few very discernible relics, part of a button and a nail or two were placed in an envelope and removed, together with the covering sandstone slab to the Gulford Courthouse National, National Military Park in Greensboro. There, an opposing 19-foot-high monument surmounted by a statue of Hooper in colonial dress and in orator's pose honors the patriotic services of William Hooper and his friend and colleague John Penn. The sandstone slab with six additional words deeply incised Signer of the Declaration of Independence was later returned to the original Hillsborough gravesite. Hooper's portrait was painted in 1873 by the prominent Philadelphia artist James Reed Lambden, who was commissioned by the Committee on the Restoration of Independence Hall. Lambden's portrait copied the head of William Hooper in John Trumbull's study for his famous painting the signing of the Declaration of Independence. It remains uncertain, however, whether Trumbull actually painted Hooper from life. In February 1790, Trumbull traveled to Charleston, Charleston, South Carolina to collect likenessness of the signers, but it seems unlikely that Hooper's swiftly deteriorating condition at that date would have permitted even short sittings for a sketch. John Adams, in his diary, states that Patrick Henry, Henry Lee, and William Hooper were the orators of Congress. On April 26th of 1775, William Hooper departed aboard, this, aboard the schooner Polly for the Second Continental Congress. So he actually took a schooner, Polly, uh, to get there. He was urged not to yield a single point to the British, but he demurred hoping instead that the British would act with prudence. On May 10th of 1775, he took his seat in the Philadelphia Congress. During the Revolution, Hooper's brothers Thomas and George were wealthy merchants in both Wilmington, North Carolina and Charleston, South Carolina. Thomas became suspect as a British merchant and some of his goods were seized by Patriot committees. The brothers were labeled as Tories with the confiscation of some of their properties. It is hard to imagine the concern this might have given Hooper. With the ratification of the, of the definitive treaty in 1786 and 87, Thomas and his brother George were free from the threat of banishment and their property was restored to them. After attending three Congresses, William Hooper began to tire of the routine. Concerning life in Congress, Hooper declared despondently, I am weary of politics. It is a study that corrupts the human heart, degrades the idea of human nature, and drives men to the expedience that morality must condemn. And of course, you know, one thing I did want to note is I bring it up, you know, because it's, it's an important topic to bring up, of course. And that is William Hooper and uh, the issue of slavery. Uh, William Hooper, uh, like 41 other founding fathers, um, probably close to, if not even more, um, William Hooper was a slave owner. But there is no record of him combating the institution or deploring it. Um, now, some other things I found in my research to Hooper and slavery... Uh, here's a little excerpt. Along the North Carolina coast in the spring of 1776, slaves were going over to the British. William Hooper, another one of North Carolina signers of the Declaration of Independence, sadly noted, the Negroes are deserting from the sea coast. Three of mine were intercepted on their way and are now in gold jail. The muster roll list of people in military units or on ships of British ships stationed off Cape Fear recorded the names of blacks who deserted from the rebels or fled for protection. When British, when the British evacuated Wilmington in November of 1781, 
William Hooper's slaves acted in different ways. Three of them left with the British. A fourth, Lavinia, went on board the fleet and much against her will was forced ashore by some of my friends and returned to me, Hooper explained. Lavinia's brother, John, however, resisted British bribes. Though offered clothes, money, and freedom, John refused to leave his master. He stole through British sentries and traveled 70 miles to rejoin the Hooper family. So that's just a little about what I could find regarding William Hooper and slavery. So he definitely was a slave owner, um, but there's just not a whole lot except for those couple excerpts that really get into in real deep ways um, about William Hooper and his, at least his thought and his, uh, his opinion on slavery and the issue of slavery. So uh, there you have it, guys. William Hooper, our first signer from the state of North Carolina, the misunderstood patriot, prophet of independence. I hope you enjoyed this look at William Hooper's life, legacy, and his death. He did die, as we know, in uh, Hillsboro, North Carolina. And you're going to see in the bonus footage, I have visited his original grave site at the Old Town Cemetery there in Hillsboro. And I, of course, have visited his current grave site, which is at that Gulliford National Military Park uh, in North Carolina. So you're going to see my pictures from the Hillsboro Old Town Cemetery, the original grave, and then, of course, from the uh, Gulliford uh, National Military Park in Greensboro, North Carolina. You're going to see all my pictures from that stuff. Um, and that's pretty much it. I, I might add the, uh, the Hooper Nash house, which is in, uh, I believe that's in Wilmington. I did not visit that. Um, just so everyone knows, uh, the Hooper Nash house is not something that I visited. So any of the photos that you see will be stock photos. That's actually in Hillsboro. I said Wilmington. It's actually in Hillsboro, the uh, Nash Hooper house. So, uh, I will show you pictures of that in bonus footage, but I have never actually uh, been there. Those are all stock photos that I'm showing you in the bonus footage. So there you go, guys. Next week, stay tuned for our second North Carolina signer, Joseph Hughes. He'll be next week. Hope you enjoyed this. I certainly did. Thank you for everything, all the subscribes, the likes, the comments, the questions, all of it. Keep it coming. And we will see you next week for our next Declaration of Independence Signer Series installment. Thanks so much, guys. See you next week. Bye-bye now. Hey guys, TJ here with Dead History. I just wanted to say, as you're looking at William Hooper's original gravesite, many historians believe that much of his remains are still in this original gravesite. Yeah, the majority of William Hooper's remains are supposedly still in his original gravesite, the one you're seeing on your screen now. That's what many historians believe. So... Just wanted to give you that little, little interesting fact.